Um, let's jump over to the Eastern Conference though. Brooklyn, they 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 got a big win, but they took a took a big loss. James Harden, uh, right hamstring, went down about a minute into the game. Didn't bother the Nets at all because that team is so so deep. That roster is so deep. They still manhandle Milwaukee. Um, I'm I am a little bit concerned about Harden's injury and if he if he will miss an extended period of time. But I mean, if the Nets play the way they did in game one, because I mean, literally they, they had Harden in the game for, for a minute, maybe if that, and they completely dominated Milwaukee. Um, I thought they would with the big three with the big two. I thought it would have been a little bit more competitive because I do think that Milwaukee definitely upgraded the roster from last season. Drew Holiday, I thought he was amazing in, in the first round and them kind of redeeming themselves, so to speak, against, you know, sweeping Miami and getting them out of here early. But they are completely outmatched with this Brooklyn Nets team. It's looking like with or without James Harden. I I, I had them win in the series. Um, I thought it was going to be a close series. I still expect it to be a close series. I am concerned about Harden, though, because last time when he hurt his hamstring, he missed 20 games. So you don't want this to become a lingering thing where, you know, he's in the lineup, out of the lineup. Um, but Blake Griffin gave him an amazing minutes yesterday. Blake looked like the old Blake, you know, Duncan, knocking down threes, pick and roll game. And if they're going to get that type of contribution from Blake, yeah, they, they're going to be almost unstoppable because Kyrie and KD, you could pencil them in for 25 to 30 every night. You know, they rolling out of bed and getting you that. You know that. So if Blake is going to give you them type of contributions. If Joe Harris is going to shoot the ball like that, they almost unstoppable. And if you're the Bucks. You have to play damn near perfect to beat them. Like Giannis played well yesterday. Holiday played well yesterday. They got good minutes from Brooke Lopez, but they ain't get much from, from Chris Middleton. I think he was like six of 23 yesterday. Chris Middleton has to play better because, again, you're already going against a team that has so much firepower. You need to be clicking. So if Milwaukee wants to make this a series, Chris Middleton has to play better. Uh, one other thing that's needed, I guess it's just a coach's perspective, is that other side of the coin. Like you could talk stats and numbers all day, but Brooklyn had a different heart. Had a different sense of urgency. Like I felt like Milwaukee played flat. I felt like they were like so. Um, what's the word? Like they were so like elated with okay, we beat Miami. That it, it seemed. It seemed to me like it seemed like they played like they thought this was gonna be easy. They got the and like you said, they played. Yeah, comfortable. like it was like yeah, and it's it, and it's that we celebrated. So you know that fire, it it kind of went out with them. And if you watch just their demeanor, just their body language, it was like Brooke, You would you would have thought that Brooklyn was like a number eight seed like fighting for their lives, the way that they came out and played. Like Brooklyn played like they had something to prove. And I think that that has to be considered because like you said, the playoffs is a different animal. And that that's that other component, that fire, that heart, that urgency. That's a, and that's the rookie a, just didn't have it. No, nah, that's a great point, Coach, because early in the game, Blake full out dove for a loose ball. When, I'm, again, we're talking first quarter, maybe the first six minutes of the game. And yeah, full out, you know, and at least a little scrum on the court. But yeah. Normally, that's the type of thing you see late in the game when the, the game's in a balance. Blake brought that early. Like, nah, we this is how much we needed. And immediately, you saw the crowd go crazy. And then from that point on, the Brooklyn crowd was great yesterday. I thought they were better yesterday than any of those first-round games. The Brooklyn crowd yesterday felt like that intensity. Like, we want this, and we want it way worse than you want it. Yeah. I'm going to have to put a call out to uh, to Joe's and tell him, yo, we need in. We need, we need to be in the Barclays Center for, for one of these uh, these playoff games. I don't know. It's probably too late for game two, but if they keep playing the way they was, we might not be able to get there into the conference uh, finals because <laughs> the way they was looking yesterday, man. Oh, my goodness. Shout out to Blake because he's another one who everybody thought, oh, he's done. He's in Detroit. He was playing horribly in Detroit. And then you realize, you know, it, it this happens a lot with guys when they get to places where they don't want to be anymore. I mean, you know, we saw it with James Harden. At the beginning of the season in Houston, James James Harden looked like two completely different players. And now we see Blake Griffin coming into his own, you know, and I got, you know, for him looking at it, he's looking at it as, you know, this is my chance. One, this is my chance to get a ring. Two, this is my chance to get a nice little contract to, to kind of close out my career because he, I'm sure if he continues this type of performance, he can get a nice little three-year deal from some team to close out, you know, the, the ending, ending of his career. But then just the rest of those guys has been amazing. Um, I mean, I think this year, just because, you know, going back, just because of the the the, the quick turnaround 
this season is pretty much going to come down who can actually keep players on the court. Because, again, I didn't know Joel Embiid was going to be playing in game one. I, I thought he was going to be out for a little while. He looked good, which I'm happy about because I want this thing to be competitive. But you got guys dropping like flies during the season, and it's not going to get easier the, 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 the longer you're going. We're talking about superstars we're losing. So, uh, you know, I'm just hoping everybody stays healthy so we can continue to have a competitive playoffs. But I, you got to love what's going on in Brooklyn right now. Um, I, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, I – I know, the, I know the Knicks fans out there, but this is that if, if the Nets win the championship, that's still a win for New York. You know, so that part. <laughs> that part. I, I know it's I know it's different. I know it's still Brooklyn, it's a Brooklyn thing, but that's New York. You know what I'm saying? Like Brooklyn rep New York maybe harder than anybody. So that's a fact. You know, that's a fact. We gotta put our support behind the town. That's a right. fact. Yeah. That's fair. Listen, man. I mean, they, they built this up. They got an opportunity to do it. Um you know, and you hope they take advantage of it because you don't know what the future holds and you don't know how long that window is going to be open. As, as Coach D mentioned earlier, you know, an injury could change that that window, uh, trade or anything. So mm-hmm. they have an opportunity. They've looked really good so far. And now it's time to just capitalize. And, and I think they're in great position to do so. Exactly. And I, I'm going to I'm going to definitely bring on the mental aspect of it. You know, that's what I do. But like. The going back to like James Harden, who he was at Houston versus who he is now, even Kevin Durant, even Kyrie Irving, Kyrie having those type of caliber players around him. A lot of the things that he's been going through or things that he's experiencing that once affected the team in the court no longer exist. And, you know, it's now getting to a point. I remember, uh, Eric, when you asked me, um, you know, is it a stigma? Is it is it something that if guys and ladies continue to speak out about, is it something that's going to hurt the game? And I'm like, I think. At this point, we're actually seeing the effects of people talking about what is going on. You know what I mean? Like Kyrie Sage in the court, that for people who know what that means, he feels unsafe, clearly. Like, so now he's purifying his space. But to the media, that's one thing. You know what I mean? So it's like now that these guys are getting more comfortable, more acclimated, and they have something to prove. So now there's this, this double dual motivation, if you will. I feel safe and I'm now motivated to do the thing it is that I do. And I think Brooklyn is a direct reflection of that. Like when guys are happy, when people are feeling slow and they're feeling good about where they are, this is, this is the result of it. So I so, think it's super important that we continue to be mindful of that. You, so so you, you think that them speaking out the way the players have took a stand, both NBA and WNBA, is a, is a benefit to their mental health? Definitely. I think it's a benefit to, to not just mental health, but mental health awareness, because it's like then we get to less idolize them for their talents and admire them as humans. Right. Like 10 years, 10, 15 years. Oh, God, I'm showing my age, maybe 20 years ago at this point when Dennis Rodman was crying and lashing out, everybody thought he was freaking crazy. But now we understand, oh, he needs a hug. Oh, you know, all these understandings, all this new information that we have. It's like it, it's less you know, it's less a stigma, you know, um, Liz, the other day with the coach, um, you know, him talking about her weight and like, now there's room to say that. And you're not the bad guy for advocating for yourself just as a human being. I think before it was like, Oh, well, if you're a player, then you, you know, you get this amount of money or you get this status, you should be subject to this type of experience. And I think now we're more as a, just as a society leading toward, even with the examples you see of people spitting and throwing bottles and no, we're human, period. Um, and I think that that's what's necessary so that way other athletes that are watching, younger athletes, can report, can say, hey, look, I'm not having a good day. Hey, coach, I, I feel emotional about something. And it's not looked at as, like, weak. You know what I mean? Because now this player has the opportunity to actually get the help that they need so they can perform better. And, I, and, and we're going to ask you to go in even deeper uh, when we get a little bit later on in the program. Because I love what you what you just said there, and we have a huge situation going on in the in the tennis world, and the, I mean really in sports in general. So I really want you to go in depth, uh, you know, later on in the program. Yo, this is Teresa Weatherspoon, better known as Teaspoon, and you're watching Real Fans, Real Talk. Live from the camp. Uh huh. This is Real Fans, Real Talk. Real Fans, Real Talk. We as real as you thought. 